Very, all right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Rev War Revelry. Tonight, we uh, take a trip up the Hudson River to uh, discuss Fort Lee in New Jersey and Fort Washington in New York. Uh, putting his reputation as a historian on the line, joining us here in the Revelry is uh, Charles Dewey. Uh, he is a 2018 graduate of BMI uh, in Lexington, Virginia, and is the special events coordinator and museum educator for Fort Lee Historic Park. So thanks for joining us. Uh, Charlie, and obviously everyone knows uh, the face down below uh, on my screen is Mark Malloy, uh, one of the historians here with Emerging Revolutionary War. Um, so with that, we'll, um, I'd like to dive back in to the big 50,000 foot view. Let's uh, hand it to Charlie about, uh, put us in the context of where Fort Lee, Fort Washington and their significance in 1776. All right, so uh, Fort Lee and Fort, uh, and Fort Washington um, are both, they exist as twin forts. Um, and the across from uh, the, the northern part of New Jersey and uh, the highest part of Manhattan, um, Manhattan Island. Right now, if you look at the George Washington Bridge on the Hudson River, um, pretty much both ends of the bridge uh, would have been exactly where those forts existed. Um, it's actually a question we had today and, uh, and someone in the, the park was asking me, uh, why were the two forts put right there? And it's, it's exactly the same reason why uh, the bridge was put there. It was a narrow part with, with high ground, um, with uh, you know, a good view of the Hudson River, and it was a way to control uh, the, the Hudson um, from uh, the British shipping in, uh, in 1776. Uh, both forts uh, were the, began uh, construction in, in the summer. Fort Washington started in June 1776 and Fort Lee began in July uh, of 1776. Um, both of the, the sites were inspected by uh, the top brass in the, the Continental Army at the time. Uh, you had William Heath, uh, Henry Knox, Green, uh, and several others, uh, Israel Putnam, both kind of blessed off on the location for um, where the where the forts should go, um, and the and Fort Washington began construction under the direction of Rufus Putnam, uh, and Fort Lee took a little bit longer to construct the fortifications uh, there. Uh, it mostly there were some uh, some batteries and um, some earthworks constructed in the summer, but it really picked up uh, in October once they realized that um, they would need to have more of a, a sturdy fortification there. Um, but the story of uh, Fort Washington and Lee is uh, really the story um, that kind of uh, fits the almost the whole Revolutionary War in the, the northern part of uh, the colonies. And that's the story of the Hudson River. Um, the Hudson, uh, in my opinion, was the uh, one of the keys to the um, both sides wanted to, to hold the Hudson. Um, they, they recognize its importance as a way to transport supplies from New England into the lower colonies. Um, it was a way for uh, locals to transport commerce um, and it would be a way for the British to um, actually cut off uh, both of those um, routes uh, and you know, precipitate an early end to the war. Um, so not to get too far into the actual uh, the diagrams of the of the forts and how they how they looked and how they existed. Uh, should I go into like the um, the New York campaign in general? Should I take that more big picture there or? Sure. Uh, first, I mean, let's uh, throw it obvious. Obviously, Fort Washington named after George Washington. Right. Uh, Fort Lee is named after what Revolutionary War leader? Let's yeah, not get the names out. We, we <laughs> it's definitely not Robert E. Lee. That's the one question we get all, all the time at the park. Um, however. Uh, Robert E. Lee's father did actually fight in, uh, in several smaller skirmishes just south of where Fort Lee is, uh, Light Horse. Uh, Harry was, was definitely uh, present in the area at the time, but uh, Charles Lee, the second, pretty much the second highest ranking general in the, the Continental Army, um, he, he visited the park for, or not the park, the fort for two days. Um, and uh, it was originally called a uh, Fort Constitution and it quickly was renamed to um, uh, to, to Fort Lee in his honor uh, sometime in the early fall of, uh, of 1776. Um, so yeah, that's uh, definitely a question we get a lot. Uh, and the, the town itself, um, it was originally uh, known as English Neighborhood. Um, There's only several townships in Northern New Jersey at that time. 
Um, but the town itself uh, has taken the name of the fort that existed there. So Fort Lee Historic Park, where I work, is now in uh, Fort Lee, New Jersey. Uh, and the name has stuck ever since. Uh, Martin, I talked about the Mario, a little bit of the New York campaign. Do you want to kind of, you know, we'll let you do the general, bring you up to the Fort Washington, and then we'll kick back over to Charlie for uh, the Fort Lee Park. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a um, uh, Revel Reverie uh, a couple months back, uh, uh, specifically just about the the, yeah, the battles around New York. Um, you know, after uh, Howe and his men are are pushed out of Boston um, in March of 1776, uh, that summer they regroup and then they come for New York City, which you know is the the, the second largest uh, city in the in, in the colonies at that time. Uh, states by the by the summer so in July of 1776 they declare their independence and uh, the British arrive that summer in New York Harbor um, you know and I think there's you know we talk about the uh, how lands there at St Staten Island and then they're gonna uh, there's gonna be major fighting in August of 1776 at Brooklyn and Long Island and Washington and part of his army is almost trapped there at Brooklyn when uh, you know, in the middle of the night, there, he does an evacuation of all his troops across the East River uh, onto, uh, onto Manhattan. And then there's a, a, an attempt there to, to make a, you know, at Washington has, I guess, you know, maybe Charlie, you can talk a little bit more about the fortifications on Manhattan, uh, because, you know, they're gonna have a line there at Harlem Heights. Um, and he's gonna be pulling all of his guys uh, from the city up to Harlem Heights when the British land at Kipps Bay uh, in September 1776, which, you know, is really disgraceful for American arms. A lot of the guys don't even fire a shot, just drop their weapons and run. Washington trying to, uh, trying to, to, to get, you know, get these guys to stand up and fight. Um, and then the next day, the British do attack at Harlem and, you know, the Americans do put up a better fight there, right. um, kind of hold off, uh, hold off the British for a little bit. Um, and then, and then how, you know, they, they take over New York city. And then I think there's an attempt to try and find a way to dislodge Washington's men on Manhattan. And there's attempts to go up around, uh, you know, flank him from Pell's point. Um, and Washington decides to pull back up to white plains. Um, and maybe that's where I'll bring in you, Charlie. So Washington's, you know, pretty, pretty much giving up on Manhattan Island at this point, but, uh, but he's leaving guys there at Fort Washington. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I just want to go back a little bit further and discuss the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Long Island, Battle of Brooklyn. It really depends on where you're from, what you call it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but the he, he, there's really a change in Washington's viewpoint. Uh, it's one of the, the things that we always talk about with um, with Washington is is his change from. Uh, viewing the, the war uh, as one that should be fought with grand decisive battles and like the, the traditional European style. And uh, it's at this time he realizes that he has to fight uh, what has become known as the War of Posts or the, uh, the Fabian strategy um, that it's, it's also called, named after the old Roman general. Um, but he, see, he says this, he writes the, 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 to Congress that he's gonna, he needs to fight a war this way, pretty much transition to a war of attrition. But he, he just doesn't do that at, at any point. He, um, he, he risks the, the army uh, at, at several points throughout the whole New York campaign. Uh, there is almost no reason. He gets the, the blessing to actually evacuate, um, evacuate Manhattan on September 14th, the day before the Kipps Bay landing. And at no point after that does he decide to fully evacuate. And then even when he does evacuate most of them, he still divides his forces and leaves some at Fort Washington. And it, it kind of um, is one of those big uh, lessons in, in how Washington was an imperfect leader at this point in the war. He was still learning how to fight uh, as a, a commander in chief of the, the Continental Forces. And uh, he, he does, it, it not just the fact that he chose to risk his army at several points, he also goes against one of the, the classic military maxims, which is you not dividing your force in the face of a superior foe. And he does that. He does it at Long Island. He does that uh, when he splits his forces, uh, leaves some at Fort Washington. He leaves um, after the Battle of White Plains. He leaves some in, up in North Castle. He leaves some in the Hudson Highlands, and he leaves some at Fort Lee. So they're all over the place, and it, and it only would take really one uh, decisive action from Howe to kind of um, trap the army and, and 
can and really spell a lot of danger for, for Washington at this point. Really, at, when he leaves the, the soldiers at Fort Washington and he makes that landing at Pell's Point, there's only one exit uh, from Manhattan Island at that point, and that's across the river to Fort Lee. Um, so that's one of those things that, uh, um, that kind of uh, always catches my attention is, is um, we, we think of Washington as the general that won the war, and he absolutely was, but it, it wasn't just a, a, a natural God-given ability that, that he had. It was something, it was trial and error. He, he was, uh, these are very, very uh, dangerous times for the Continental Army and for the, the, um, for the independence movement at that time. It, it could have ended quite poorly uh, multiple times um, throughout the New York campaign. Yeah, no, and, and, and to that point too, I, I think, I mean, just the very idea of trying to defend what New York City is, is so, seems so impossible when you're going up, you have no Navy, so you have the, right. <laughs> uh, you have the Royal Navy, one of the best in the world, you have, uh, you know, superior force in the British uh, regulars and the Hessian uh, uh, auxiliaries as well. It, I mean, it just seems so difficult, and yet Washington's willing to to attempt to try, you know, I mean, I think his, I think his own battlefield, as you mentioned, you know, I, I think his instincts aren't to, to do this, but he's also deferring to civilian authority that's also yeah. saying, you need to defend, you need to put up a fight for these cities, you can't just abandon them. Right. Um, so. Yeah, it's, um, there, there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> he he's um he defers to civilian authority a lot and he also defers to his subordinates uh, and on more than one occasion um and that's not always the uh the best decision he's, he's not really trusting his, himself at this point which um you know who knows and a and he kind of even deflects a little bit of blame for some of his losses to his subordinates even though it was his decision to to to, to make there um one of the things that i actually wanted to to, to bring up is uh, um I'm in the army, I'm an intelligence officer. So one of the things I, I tend to key on is, the, is intelligence services, um, especially in the, the New York campaign. And the, the big part about the New York campaign in terms of intelligence is that there was very little, like they didn't have a lot. Um, he actually considered his cavalry to be um, expensive and he dispatched them at several points. Um, then he, he, uh, he gets the Knowlton's Rangers, the famed uh, unit, the, the beginning of the army intelligence corps um, that's, that's pretty much August when he decides to, to raise that core and he doesn't use them in any way other than just traditional reconnaissance and, and whatnot. And even then, um, it's, it's very, uh, it's a very minimal unit. He doesn't use them to the best visibility. And, um, at several points, his lack of intelligence costs him pretty dearly, uh, not defending or not recognizing how many soldiers were landing at that Long Island, um, not realizing, uh, what the, what Hal's intentions were at several points. Um, and failing to secure several flanks or not realizing that he was vulnerable in several positions. Um, and he, he tries to, you know, course correct at several points. He, he does have um, some uh, people giving him information on, on what's going on in, uh, in New York City at this time. Uh, you had, but the, you definitely didn't have people like the Culper Ring. You didn't have uh, these famed um, uh, spies that, that, you know, informed his, his decision making later on in the war. You, you had a, a man that was pretty much fighting blindly at, at a lot of the uh, engagements he was in. Um, and I think that's that's one of those things that he definitely learned a lesson from later on in the war. It's probably uh, also, sorry, just jump in real quick on that point, isn't it probably also uh, New York is a highly loyalist population that is there as well. Yeah. So the civilian aspect, I mean, when you're fighting Something like that there isn't a, maybe I'm mistaken, but I think there was a what a civilian died or whatever that directed Clinton forces to make a pass or some of that nature. So I mean, so I mean when you don't have the civilian aspect, um, we see that especially in later wars, it all, all depends on you got who you can support that's outside the, the the regular military structure as well. And I mean, so he's facing a number of strikes, and then um, also the removal of maybe Charles Lee, and I think someone else gets sick. Um, so uh, uh, Green gets sick at one Green. point, right before the Battle of Long Island, and he has to appoint um, uh, General Sullivan uh, at that point, whose abilities are, are highly questionable at, at this point in the war. And even then, he has this guy, he removes him from command, he puts Putnam in charge, and then Sullivan and uh, General Sterling get captured after the battle. So he's, he's also shorthanded in terms of his... Um, his experienced generals at this time. So it, it's, uh, but uh, the, as your, to your point about the loyalist population, New York never really, uh, never really changed that, that it stayed loyalist pretty much throughout the entirety of the war. 
Uh, and when the British did control uh, it afterwards, it became kind of a, a place of refuge for um, a lot of the, the loyals from New Jersey as the, um, the Continentals began to retake ground. But yeah, and that's one thing that the, the British counted on, but uh, they never really, uh, they never maximized the, the asset that they probably had right in front of them. And that's um, giving the, the loyalists uh, the benefit of the doubt or the, the ability to fight along with them. They never took advantage of that to the, the, the fullest. And that's something that definitely, I think, um, Hal uh, kind of bungled there at the beginning. Um, but it certainly uh, helped Hal out that he would have um, people loyal to his cause that were willing to inform um, his decision making, and it didn't really help Washington uh, all that much. Even though he did try to, um, uh, the, the Nathan Hale was one of the, the big uh, uh, figures in um, this part of the war. Uh, in early September, he sends uh, Hale um, down into the, the city, and eventually he's caught. Uh, he he <laughs> it tells you that the, the spies, that, like I was saying, that even when he does have people that are willing to form him, they're not very talented. They're not skilled at that their at their craft just yet, and it, he they pay dearly for it. And Hale is hanged, and yeah, supposedly says when he's hanged, I regret I have but one life to lose for my country. Um, do we know where that happened? Because I, I was looking to try and find to see in your yeah, where that um, happened. I, I don't think they actually have pinpointed the, the location. They they say it's it's um kind of up in the area of um oh gosh, it's not coming to me. Um but it, he's there, there's a couple of disputed locations. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of different markers. But. And there's, but not only that, but it's also, it's disputed that he even said the, that line in, in uh, uh, it, that, that was, uh, the, the debate is that Washington kind of created that after the fact is more of a recruiting pitch, um, possibly. It's, it is possible that he, that he did say that or he said something similar. I think what they've also said is it, it was something along the lines of, um, I, I have the honor to serve to the, the fullest of my ability or something like that. But it was something patriotic was what his last words were, but it may not have been the words that we've come to remember Hale by uh, as saying. Yeah, like, and I think uh, that, that same line is in the play Cato. Um, right, yes, yes, and he, which is Washington. So yeah, it's like interesting, either that or either, yeah, they were putting that those words in there or he, yeah, he used the quote uh, for his last words or that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I think well, it's an excellent character, but it's um, it, it's definitely uh, kind of a tragic story. And he's actually under the command of Knowlton, the uh, the the um, part of the intelligence corps. He's um, you know, kind of picked from the 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 group to, or he volunteers to to go um, as part of that. And uh, as we quickly see, Knowlton um, is a casualty of the Battle of Harlem Heights. And later on, uh, I guess we'll get into it when we get into Fort Washington. But that the the Rangers are completely captured, and they don't really play a part in. Uh, this at this time of the war anymore. So it's um, the intelligence corps and the intelligence services in general took a, a pretty massive hit throughout the campaign. Even even whatever uh, asset they they served to Washington, they weren't really uh, didn't last. <laughs> to sum up with Hale as uh, one teacher once told me, uh, you never let the facts get in the way of a good story. So that's uh, yeah, no, what we yeah. said. It's it's a good story there. Um, and we actually I got a few comments already about what uh, Hale said. So that's the First comments coming in. If anyone does have any questions for Charles or uh, Mark or myself, just feel free to put them in the chat. But um, so we're getting so how got Washington's army up to the White Plains, and then um, well, Fort Washington is still there. What um, this is a question I have. Um, how big of a debate was it by uh, Green and the uh, commander's name is escaping me off the top of my head, uh, uh, Washington to get to keep Fort Washington there because it makes no sense when you when you look at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think um, this is an important um, uh, it's an important debate to be had because again it goes back into the the Fabian strategy that I just talked about. Uh, it, if Washington's adhering to the strategy and he, he clearly wasn't um, he it, all senses would have said to abandon um, uh, Fort Washington at this time. But McGaw um, there's several things that he actually uh, several incidents take place um, that lead him to start building up his confidence and putting a bug in green and, uh, and green in Washington's ear, um, to, to hold the fort. And going back to what I was mentioning before about Fort Washington, it was a, it was the, the, the tallest part on Manhattan Island. Um, uh, when they picked the place, uh, I, I can't remember who said it, but it was kind of an agreement among all the, the continental generals that if properly defended and if the fortifications were, um, were sound, it, the, the, 
the fortifications would be in, uh, impregnable for, to, to British forces. So they, they were really confident in, um, in being able to hold uh, this, the, this work here. And they, they really did fortify it in, uh, in a pretty substantial way. They had three separate lines uh, of uh, trenches and, and kind of foxholes. Uh, it was also a steep, craggy um, kind of cliff that you had to, to scale to get to the top of Fort Washington. Um, there was uh, briars that uh, people have mentioned um, having to, to, to climb through and, and get scratched up as they were assaulting Fort Washington. So it's the, the, they picked a good spot really um, to, to defend. So, um, but in August, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, October, uh, McGaw actually um, fires upon uh, two ships um, where the British are attempting a landing and they're trying to take Fort Washington in October. Uh, and McGaw actually, um, and the, the cannons from Washington and, and Lee, um, put uh, significantly damage uh, the and, and do um, and create quite a few casualties among the British forces there. And McGaw feels pretty confident about uh, what he just happened to to, to do. Um, and then on November eighth, um, the uh, the Hessian general um, Knipphausen, he actually uh, from Fort Independence just above Kingsbridge, he attempts to take um, Fort Washington as well, and McGaw repels that um, uh, attack. So he's uh, feeling pretty confident about his ability to defend the fort. He actually tells uh, Washington to, um, or he tells Green or tells Washington, the word gets around that McGaw believes that they can hold the fort uh, until December, um, <laughs> which it turns out to not be true. But McGaw's feeling confident and Green uh, also pushes to, to hold the, the fort. And Washington, um, I guess trusting Green uh, at, at this point, uh, I, I have to imagine he, he definitely wavered um, but the decision was really made for him at, at, before he could really make up his mind uh, and they began to assault Fort Washington. So uh, by, by not making a decision, Washington essentially did make a decision um, in, in the end and it, it cost him dearly. But he's actually in the fort, I think, uh, if I'm correct, when the attacks begin. Isn't he, uh, the, the military brass rode across the river. And, yes. um, yeah, because House forces um, and um, Take what a multiple approach is a three or four pronged attack um, on the on the Fort Washington uh, yeah, that yeah. day. Um, there are about um, so let me make my little plug here. There's about I think three thousand defenders uh, yeah. at Fort Washington. Um, one of the guys, uh, some there is under a guy named Moses Rawlings, the uh, Virginia Maryland rifleman. Some of the first ones to, to march north. Um, and actually, one of the guys I did my uh, grad school work on, uh, Otho Otho Holland Williams, is actually there. Um, as well, he will be uh, uh, captured and imprisoned. In the, uh, but uh, they they fight only with the southern end of the of the fort. But uh, uh, do you happen to know the other units that are there? Are they Continentals? Are they militia? Um, what is the force that uh, McGall has? Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually. I, I don't want to give the wrong answer on, on who's there uh, at that point. But the, you mentioned the ones that, that I know of for certain. I know of the. Uh, the British uh, at that point, you have the, the Hessians uh, up north. Um, those are under uh, Knipphausen and, and more the, the maneuver portion of it is controlled by Johann Rahl, um, who's uh, actually his, his memoir is one of the, is a great resource to, to kind of seeing how life as a, in the Hessian army at that time. Uh, from the south, you had, uh, you had Lord Percy uh, assaulting the, that southern position that you were just mentioning. Um, and then you had, uh, you had Sterling kind of pushing in from the east up Laurel Hill towards, towards Fort Washington. And they were um, holding out, as, uh, the Continentals there were holding out as long as they could. They were the riflemen um, preventing the, them from, uh, um, from taking the fort fully. But that, when they eventually do, uh, I may be getting ahead of myself here, but they, uh, it's the, the southern and uh, eastern ends that kind of collapse first and force them to start running back towards the fort. Um, that kind of leads towards the eventual demise of, uh, of uh, the fort there. Now, before we talk more about you know, what happened at Fort Washington, um, I mean, the best part is uh, McGaw's reply, right? To when the British tell him to surrender or the, uh, or the, the entire force would be put to the sword. Um, and McGaw right. is very defiant in his response. And, says something to the effect of like, you know, actuated by the most glorious cause mankind ever fought and I'm determined to yes. hold to the yeah. last extremity. Uh, it's pretty, pretty cool reply if, uh, but I guess uh, 
uh, a poor decision nonetheless. Yeah, uh, the, the fork falls in about five hours. <laughs> so it's it's kind of a um, anticlimactic. Uh, all all uh, all talk less uh, um, less follow through uh, on on his part there. You know, he said first it was that they would last till December. Then it was yeah, we'll fight till we're we're done. But under the threat of um, British artillery um, and you know pretty much. Uh, a, a long siege, there's uh, not much you can really do at that point. Washington actually does beg um, uh, McGaw to hold out until nightfall um, at the fort there. Um, and McGaw, uh, he actually, the, uh, it's a pretty cool story. He's a guy named John, John Gooch is the messenger and he's sent across from Fort Lee um, to, to McGaw. And he actually winds up escaping to get back to, to Fort Lee uh, by, literally jumping down the cliffs, rolling all the way down, evading uh, the, the British and the Hessians at the lower part of the cliffs, getting back onto a boat and rowing across to, to Fort Lee. Um, but McGaw isn't able to hold out to a nightfall and they're not able to evacuate the, uh, the Continentals that are in Fort Washington at that time. Oh, what That's a, I, I was going to say, it's interesting talking about how you get down those steep cliffs or whatever. I mean, it's interesting even for like, I wonder how Washington and, you know, if he's in the fort and they determine we got to get you across the river, how yeah. do they quickly get down to the riverbank, cross, and then get back? You know, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. it had to have been an intense thing to do, so. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, the, the whole scale of, of not just the of Fort Washington, but where Fort Lee was in the Palisades. When you think about, like, the sheer, um, just the, the, um, immensity of it all just the how steep the cliffs were how uh under fire with you know british ships in the water it, you had uh you know pretty much circled on all sides like it's a it's a very very dramatic you know probably should be a movie about it made someday because it's really a dire time and it's the the, the margin for error is so slim for for all of them um but it, it's definitely an interesting time that uh you know i wish people knew more about so with the, I mean, it's, in, it's got three rows of defenses. It's in, I mean, is uh, the 3,000 man garrison, you may not know the answer, 3,000 man garrison, is that sufficient to hold the works or is that too small? Is it the fort bigger? Should it have a hot, bigger garrison? Um, put it in kind of perspective, like what size fort are we talking about? Because there's not much, there's nothing there anymore, correct? No, there's not. There's, if, if you go there, there's just a, there's pretty much a plaque um, uh, where Fort Tryon Park is. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's a, the breastworks and everything that, uh, they had a pretty considerable system of batteries all around there too, pretty much guarding on all sides. So they, they were, they were well covered in almost every direction in, in terms of that. They, they built a Pentagon kind of shape, uh, for the center of the fort itself. And then, as I was saying, there was kind of three, uh, three lines of, um, of defenses built out of earthworks, all, all expanding outward. And the plan was to kind of push all of the Continentals outward and, and kind of have them hold it before they had to retreat to the fort itself. Um, and uh, under heavy fire, it's pretty much they retreat back from uh, line to line uh, until they eventually get back up into the fort where they kind of perceive it to be relative uh, safety at that point. But, but once you're in a fort on, on, in one you know, location, all they need to do is bring up artillery as Howe did and it's, it's pretty much curtains from there. I know they forget the one valuable thing is you need uh, water or whatnot. Um, yeah. There's no water inside the fort. So. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely. Um, that was one of the things that that was definitely on Hal's mind at, at that point was, um, you know, they, they can stay there forever, but they're, they're not going to have any supplies and they can only last for so long. Uh, one of the things I, I definitely don't want to forget to, to mention as well is uh, one of the things we get asked a lot about is uh, Margaret Corbin. Anyone that's traveled on the, the New Jersey Turnpike has seen uh, the the, uh, the rest area, Margaret uh, um, uh, Corbin, and um, it's uh, uh, she actually was uh, in the uh, at Fort Washington. Her husband John Corbin was on the one of the gun crews there, and he he is uh, is killed, and she uh, takes his place, and she's eventually wounded in three separate places, um, and that uh, I guess she's credited as being the first known female combatant in the, the Revolutionary War. I'm sure there were, there were more prior to then, but um, that's one of the stories that we, we get asked a lot about. Um, it's a pretty unique story of heroism on the, on the battlefield at Fort Washington. It's uh, amazing, impeccable timing there, Charlie, because we just literally got a question in about what a Margaret Corbin of Fort Washington. And as soon as yeah. that popped off, there we go. You know, there it is. It's like you uh, knew it was coming. So, uh, yeah, I can't even see the comments, so that's, 
<laughs> that's an intelligence uh, officer right there. He's yeah, seeing the uh, questions coming in. But well, that's the doctor on the military intelligence. They don't really go. Uh, yeah. There you go. A plug for military intelligence. And then, um, so we talked about this guy named uh, yeah, Johan Rall. I think he uh, memoir is great, but I think it kind of ends around Trent or Princeton. Uh, Mark probably knows more about that. Um, but I think it's Rall is the one that will get the honor, I think, of accepting the, the surrender. Uh, is that, it's the Hessians that um, are given that honor, correct? Uh, I believe so. Uh, so it, um, and so they, um, so it's a, it's about a five hour engagement on uh, November 16th, as you said. Um, do we have, uh, how many, what besides the manpower, what, I mean, Washington loses the, the free, all, almost all the, the force, right? No one really escapes. Yeah, they, they, the, the, the number of, of captured uh, is somewhere around 2,800, 2,870 some odd people are captured in, in there. Um, including um, all of the Rangers, um, several other uh, key people. And they're actually, they're marched out uh, into a uh, crowd of New Yorkers and they're, they're kind of uh, spit on and, and have things thrown at them on their way to, to prisons in, in, uh, in New York. But, um, and the, the number killed at the battle was about 149, um, which is actually not nearly as many as uh, they killed of um, uh, British forces that were killed while trying to uh, attack Fort Washington, which is a, uh, um, kind of, I think, we'll, when we talk about more about what happens next, uh, it definitely plays into Washington's mind. Uh, despite losing the fort, he, they do manage to inflict quite a bit of casualties on the, on the British Army and holding Fort Washington. That it doesn't replace the you know, losing 2,800 soldiers when you only have, you know, several thousand left after that. But it's it's definitely something that, um, you know, it was it was a hard fought five hours for sure. And the spirit of engagement is not just a uh, breakthrough and run to the fort type thing. Um, yeah. And I think uh, if I read correctly, um, doing a little bit of research before this, is that Magal, who's captured, actually gets, I think, married while he's uh, imprisoned in uh, New York. Um, so um, he actually yeah, uh, is treated like an officer. I know Williams is actually thrown in solitary confinement, um, even though he's an officer, because they think he's what corresponding. Um, and he credits that actually with uh, breaking his health. Even though he served the rest of the war, he does die uh, in his 40s in 1794. So, um, before I forget, too, I would also want to, to mention it's because it's a very important piece to it all is that, um, and Washington uh, and, and McGaw both knew this, but in early November, uh, two weeks before the engagement, uh, McGaw's adjutant actually defects to the British. Uh, William DeMont is his name. Um, and he, in exchange for a, some kind of promotion, he's like the deputy commissary of prisoners or something along those lines for the, for the British. He leaves and he provides Howe with, um, or he provides Clinton with plans, but, uh, and gives them to, to Howe on uh, um, the weaknesses at Fort Washington. So uh, there's definitely, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, that kind of got overlooked uh, when they were making those decisions to, to hold the fort, but it's definitely something that maybe should have taken a little bit more precedence. Yeah, the enemy has your uh, your game plan. It's kind of uh, yeah, you might need to change your game plan. Uh, yeah, you might you might need to chalk that one up to, to hubris. Uh, you know, they they think they have an impregnable fortress uh, on Fort Washington there, but apparently this this guy is leaving with with some weaknesses for the for the British, and they might have needed to look into that a little bit more. And for those uh, twenty eight hundred guys that are captured, yeah, many of them, yeah. I'm sure wind up on uh, prison ships uh, yeah. out in New York Harbor. And I always think that one of the neatest places to visit in New York City is uh, Fort Greene, where they have the uh, prison ship martyrs monument, um, yeah. uh, where, you know, because a lot of people don't realize how many thousands of these guys die of terrible conditions on these prison oh, yeah. ships. Uh, and, and even, and, and, but like almost all prison conditions, uh, the prison ships in particular are known to be houses of, of horror pretty much, but there's also several others inside the city uh, himself. The Sugar House Prison is one of the, uh, the more known ones with, um, uh, <laughs> you know, people with pretty sinister nicknames, you know, uh, bloody, uh, bloody Bill, I think was, was one of the, the ones there. And they're, they're known as being these pretty cruel, um, uh, you know, wardens of, over these, uh, these provosts. So it, 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 life as a prisoner was definitely not uh, anything better than what they were experiencing in the, um, <laughs> well under siege at, at Fort Washington or anywhere else in the, the area. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, 
Uh, and a lot of them uh, do eventually, uh, there are released in prisoner exchanges, but a lot of them do perish uh, from illness or otherwise while they're in there. Um, and that's a, a recurring theme throughout the war. And you could have been in prison for more than just being captured on the battlefield. If you were, um, there's multiple instances of people, uh, especially in New York City, uh, that are accused of being um, you know, rebels that, that are uh, in prison for supposedly providing uh, information to the Continentals. Uh, so it's, yeah, life as a prisoner in New York City is, is definitely not, um, <laughs> you don't die of starvation, you're probably gonna die of illness and if you don't get released first, so not great. And uh, when Fort Washington falls, uh, Washington is watching this from Fort Lee at the time or where is he? And I yeah. think there's a story of him like, so there's it. a lot of, yeah, we have to kind of dispel this, this rumor a little bit. Um, there, there's one of the, the classic uh, books that I'm not, I'm not going to, to, to talk bad about a particular um, historian. I'm a, I'm a big fan of John Furling's book, Almost a Miracle, which he talks quite a bit about um, the, the more the military uh, portions of this, but uh, Furling kind of plays into the notion that Washington broke down and cried while watching uh, Fort Washington fall. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that to be true. He's a man that wasn't really known for showing much emotion, if any at all. I'm sure he wasn't at all happy about watching Fort Washington fall, but um, imagining him breaking down and crying um, there is, is definitely not, um, doesn't seem very realistic in, in my opinion. Who knows, I could be wrong, but um, he's definitely um, kind of shell-shocked though. That's one of the things that is, is really apparent from his letters after Fort Washington falls. And I think that actually was a, um, led to kind of a tactical uh, error on his, his point. He, he writes that he's, um, not only that, but Green is also like he blames Green a bit for for choosing to hold the fort. But you know, Washington did have the, the ability to remove everyone from from there. And um, one of the interesting things, um, you know, I, I'm, we're gonna I guess we'll start in a few minutes. We'll talk about Fort Lee. But there's uh, the whole cliffs of the Palisades northward. There at one point earlier on in the month, they're guarding those 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 passes where eventually the the, the British will wind up scaling. But um, at this time, there's no one guarding them. They're, they're, they're kind of waiting for those four days. They're kind of removing stores from Fort Lee after Fort Washington Falls. They realize that it's, it's useless without it. Um, Fort, without Fort Washington, Fort Lee is useless. They re begin moving the stores further into New Jersey, but um, the, he, he's not really making much haste in doing it. He doesn't think that, that Howe is going to make a, um, uh, an effort into New Jersey at this time. Uh, he definitely is, uh, you know, uh, had he, he kind of expected it, it, it may have turned out a little bit differently. Um, and his indecision wound up costing him. So let's use that as a segue to jump across the Hudson. So Fort Washington's fallen. Um, does the Continental Army stay at Fort Lee? Um, or what happens at Fort Lee? So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, whoever managed to get out of Fort Washington, which was, isn't, which isn't very many at this time, and whoever's left, there were soldiers at Fort Lee the whole time, uh, and they mostly make up the the flying camp, um, what was known as the flying camp, and uh, pretty much under um, General Hugh Mercer's command. Um, but Green and Washington, Washington moves further into Hackensack after um, after the battle is over, but you still have Green at the fort, and you still have about 34, 3,500 soldiers at, at Fort Lee. Um, you have the 20th Continental um, um, there, but you also, mostly it's just militia and, and the flying camp. Um, and there's about 30 cannon. There's, um, you know, tons of, of shot and ammunition. They, and they're not really, like I said, making much haste in getting out of, uh, of Fort Lee. Um, uh, then what happens, the, on November 19th, the, the morning of November, night of November 19th, morning of November 20th, um, Howe moves about 5,000 uh, forces up towards Phillips House, uh, about six miles north um, of Fort Washington up the, um, up the Hudson River. And he crosses on flat bottom boats um, across the Hudson River in the dead of night in a, a rainy, cloudy night. Um, and he begins to scale the Palisades with the, the aid of, um, as we were talking before, uh, loyalist uh, guides that kind of, you know, pointing them through the passes, which is, again, another, another key um, uh, how having loyalists in the area uh, and, and you know being disgruntled about the continental forces being there can can really hamper uh, your tactics. But uh, so how pushes? Uh, so you have the 33rd Regiment of Foot. You have the, the 42nd, 
um, the Highlanders, and you have uh, some Hessian forces along with them, totaling about 5,000 soldiers, and they scale the, the Palisades, and the, they even bring their cannons along with them. Now, luckily, um, there's a uh, young lieutenant uh, that's stationed on a, an outpost um, north of the um, north of Fort Lee. His name is John Clifford. Uh, we can thank Todd Braestead for, for kind of finding the, this information. Um, it's one of those big myths that um, has always been the, the legend of Bergen County is the, the legend of the Closter Horseman. Um, this, this guy who rode back and warned Fort Lee of uh, the impending British uh, force uh, that, was, that was coming down on Fort Lee. But it, it was, you know, a Closter Horseman turned out to be this, this lieutenant. Um, and he, he rides back and he warns Green, who immediately uh, gathers what they can. Um, they don't really have any wagons, so they can't bring much with them. Uh, and they immediately make out for uh, Liberty Pole in uh, now what is present day Anglewood, New Jersey. Um, the, they kind of, uh, the Crown forces, once they reach the top of the cliffs, they, they kind of stop to gather and make sure everyone's there. Uh, they, they don't make an immediate push towards Fort Lee. Um, again, they missed a kind of an opportunity there, but when they do arrive at Fort Lee, they find about 70 or 80 uh, soldiers still in the fort that are um, drunken from the night before. Um, they, they find about 30 cannons uh, and all the, the winter equipment and whatnot, but the American army is long gone. Uh, the only thing they leave left there is the, the, the supplies I just mentioned before, and they leave the, literally the, the pots cooking their food in the morning um, are left with the fires burning underneath them. Uh, so they, they really made it out in the nick of time. Um, Washington rides up from, uh, from Liberty Pole uh, or to Liberty Pole from Hackensack to kind of um, uh, give some direction to the, to the retreat at this point. And he takes them down to, to Newbridge um, in, in, in present day uh, River Edge, New Jersey. And they cross the Newbridge and they wind up burning it um, with the, the British army close behind. Uh, and that's, that, that's what kind of kicks off the, the, the retreat across New Jersey. Um, you know, that, that, that whole, uh, you know, really dangerous month there, the times that try men's souls that Thomas Paine uh, wrote about. Um, you know, Thomas Paine was at Fort Lee. Um, one of those things that people don't quite realize about Paine is that he, uh, he was a writer, but he, for a brief time, he actually was a, um, he was an adjutant. He was given the rank of general under uh, Nathaniel Green, and he spent a little bit of time at, at, at Fort Lee. Um, so it's during that retreat there that he actually writes uh, the crisis number one. Um, that we that we know about today. And so uh, while we're on the subject, we got a question uh, that came in. As you mentioned that uh, Payne was an adjutant for Green uh, from, from one of our uh, watchers. Why did Washington not lose faith in Green after this total disaster at Fort Washington? So, so a question then. You know, I, <laughs> but I think you know this may be kind of a disappointing answer, but I think he probably should have. <laughs> um, at this point, like I don't know if I would have had the same patience with the with the commander. Um, but also too, uh, I don't think he really had a chance to um, kind of go with anyone else at this time. Um, Green was there, he, he, you fight with the, the army you have, I guess is the, the old saying, he, he, there's not really much time for, for making um, hasty decisions. And he doesn't have many of his generals uh, at, at this point, he kind of has to go with, with, with Green. Eventually that does pay off. Obviously we know how Green was instrumental to the war effort um, you know, later on, but uh, he believed Green to be a fighter, despite the, the mistakes that, that, uh, that he might have made. And I think Washington also had a lot of self-doubt, too. He knew truly that um, it was probably his decision to uh, evacuate the fort um, in the end. But that's, that's speculation on my part. I, I, I can't speak to his state of mind, but um, that's definitely, definitely a good question. It's something that I, I, I wish I, I, I tried to do some more research into it. But I, other than Green's letters about how he... Green himself was distraught, and then Washington's kind of um, explanation to Congress, that's just, just about um, all I've seen on it. Mark, uh, do you want to weigh in, give an opinion? What? Yeah, no, I, mean, I think, I think you know, what Charles says, correct. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, who, who else is he going to pass command off to at that point? Um, but, you know, it, and it is true, like, I don't know, you see later in the war, you see how, you know, Charles Lee is, you know, court-martialed and cashiered and you know you Horatio Gates and, and some of these other guys that are kind of like bumped out when they get into bad graces with Washington I guess that's the bigger question is like how Green stayed in Washington's graces uh so that later on he was continuing getting 
opportunities, uh, you know, whether it's quartermaster at Valley Forge or command of the Southern Army and stuff like that. And yeah, I think I think time ultimately shows that it was worthwhile keeping him around. And maybe that's one of the things that, you know, what, you know, he, he, throughout the whole New York campaign, it's just like, you know, you can just see all the negatives of Washington's command style and leadership abilities mm-hmm. and stuff. Uh, but this might be one of those things would, that he sees something good in, in green that he's willing to keep him within his good graces. And, and I know. think that's one of those things that we always talk about. And especially something that's pushed in the army is that like leadership, the art, like leadership is not just a science, uh, despite the, you know, that you may find you know, courses out there that try and teach it that way, but it, it is an art. Um, and sometimes it, it is a little bit of intuition that, that comes along with it. And it's definitely, uh, call it luck, call it intuition, call it, you know, um, you know, the art of leadership, but the, the Washington's decision to stick with green um, definitely pays off in the end, even though, you know, as I just said right there, like, I don't know if I would have the same patience to, to, to do that given what had just happened, but well, Washington I- knows that he, he also might've been at fault for that. And it was just kind of deflecting. Yeah, and, and a lot of other people, even at that time, thought that same way. You know, I know, I know, you know, Charles Lee being one of his yeah, you know, like detractors saying, you know, that Washington lacked a decisive mind and, and these kinds yeah. of things. And, and it is true that Washington's leadership style is not typical of most military men that you think of that make, you know, important decisions quickly. He is, right. you know, kind of taking this uh, a group polling to make sure everything yeah. uh, you know and he does that throughout the entire war it's amazing and, and uh, green green probably I, w- I would even say had had even a, a bigger bone to pick because from the start of the new york campaign down to fort washington and he tries to convince washington to leave at almost every opportunity that he gets uh, he, he he almost pleads with washington like, you need to get out of here this is this is going to end badly um, so it's like, Lee definitely has the, I told you so card in his back pocket, uh, when, when Elvis Christmas, but what happens a month later with, with, with Lee, <laughs> you know, he's, he's eventually captured. So, you know, it, again, it goes to the whole, who could have predicted that happening, but, um, it's definitely, again, Washington had some kind of intuition there and it definitely paid off. Imagine if he had, had deferred or, uh, gone more with green there. It's a, it's a good, uh, what about, <laughs> but yeah. And also, I'll weigh in as well, because I'll tell throw an opinion out there, is there's no good way out of it for Washington. I mean, oh, he, he is the one that's kind of used the baseball analogy, Green being the pitching coach, you fire the pitching coach, well, it's still the manager's responsibility. I mean, he's the one that has to set the tone and has to set the direction. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I, I wish you were, I wish yeah. you were the president yeah. of the New York Yankees right now, I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm an Orioles fan. We're long-suffering, so let's not even oh, right. talk baseball. Uh, okay. But, so. um, yeah, uh, but um, no, I mean, it's uh, one of the things that, and, one, and I don't want to go too far straight with the Charles Lee court martial, but it's one of the things that they, that Lee was at fault for is he made the decision where if you exonerate Lee, you're going to put Washington at blame. And right, I think, right. um, I mean, Washington is astute politically, especially on Valley Forge later on, realizing what, um, when to weigh in and the way also to let the cards kind of fall. And Green is one of those, he lets the cards uh, kind of fall. Yeah, it's one of those things too. Is that I think it's um, I think it's important uh, to remember that you know Green's also learning how to be a general at this time too. Uh, he doesn't have much experience beyond this as well. You know, we all know Green's backstory is he he's you know listed as like a, a private and he's eventually picked out to be much smarter than what he is. So he's he's also coming into his own as a general as well. As the the Connell Army is is going through you know a lot of growing pains at this time uh, and some of its most dire points um and you know I, maybe washington saw something in them that it, it definitely paid off yeah now i think the whole the fort washington lee story there is just i mean it's emblematic of like the the low point of the the continental army too because yeah. this, you mentioned thomas Paine, you know traveling with them and writing that these are the times that try men's souls and and yeah, you know, I think it's something that we in the United States today don't really think of you know, how close the whole idea of independence and uh, a separate, you know, our own United States of America came close to collapse. And I think that I think that Washington and Lee right there uh, is emblematic of it, showing how close we came. Cause yeah, he- that's that's one of the lessons that I try to I try to push to people that visit the park is that um, American independence was at this time it, it was a very fragile thing, 
uh, it was not ever at, at, at almost any point a, a, a given um, and, and no more uh, in my opinion, it may, it may just be biased because I work there, but it, that's you know truly one of the darkest times of, of the war. It, it really could have ended there, um, at or really any point in the New York campaign. Uh, how um, his in his approach, you, know, you can criticize uh, how his generalship. You know his how's always known as that guy that kind of um, is cautious and doesn't commit his forces fully, but that his decision is is really. Uh, the, of the audacity to, to scale the Palisades and, and take um, Fort Lee before the winter set in um, really caught Washington off guard. And it's, it's a very, very dire point where it, it, it really truly in a matter of about minutes could have ended the conflict right there. Um, so it's, uh, we, everyone loves to, to write um, uh, the, and I'm, I'm not trying to, to, I'm not throwing shots anywhere, but it, it's, um, you know, that this that saved that is a, is a big theme. Um, and it's true because that's it's a common theme throughout the entire war is that really at every point, it's not like one place saved the other. It's, it's at each moment, the, you know, it, it could have ended. The whole, the whole experiment could have, could have gone up in flames. Um, so yeah, it really truly was like each, when they, when they say that this, uh, this particular retreat or this particular action saved uh, the colonies or saved America, it, I, I tend to believe it, you know. Yeah, and I always say, you know, especially with this campaign and especially with the personage of George Washington, too. I mean, we mentioned how he got out of Fort Washington just before it was assaulted. Right. I mean, I mean, Washington himself, if he's either captured, killed, wounded, any, you know, at Brooklyn, at, um, at Fort Washington, at any of these points, you know, not only do you have the collapse of the Continental Army or the... Uh, you know, without George Washington, you know, it's hard to imagine how the rest of the founding saga plays out because he's going to play such a indispensable role in not only in the, the successful conclusion of the war, but then in the creation of the new uh, new countries. So. Yeah, and he definitely, he puts himself in harm's way uh, a bit there during the New York campaign too. He even, I think it's during Harlem Heights when he rides out there to try and rally everyone. He kind of stumbles upon a couple of pickets that it came very close uh, to, to, to getting them too. So um, I, that might've been another lesson that he, he kind of learned there as well, that, you know, he, he's a valuable part to the, to the war effort. And, uh, and I feel like what's not stated enough about the New York campaign is how almost it's the first real campaign of the Continental Army, if you, if you think about it. I mean, Boston is a very static siege that kind of he enters in. Um, it's uh, house has trouble, especially after the Bunker Hill, Breach Hill fight, trying to reach Washington, doesn't have the, the naval support and, and the infrastructure to do it, where New York, he does. He has been able to plan that campaign, how he's been able to bring his forces in. And Washington's really learning who these generals and how to inspire morale and so forth. I mean, we forget that Washington didn't command anything more than a regiment until a few months before this right. um, in, his, in his forces. Right. But um, I know we're, uh, uh, cut you off here, but we I want to give you time to plug Fort Lee uh, because ah, you are cool. a proud native, um, lifelong resident of New Jersey. Um, unlike Fort Washington, there are things at Fort Lee to see and in, in the surrounding area. Um, for the viewers, uh, before we got on, Charlie said he's hiked every trail and uh, everything around uh, New Jersey that deals with, Northern New Jersey deals with the Red War. So um, I'll give you a few minutes to talk and invite people um, if Fort Lee is open again, to invite them to, to Fort Lee. Yeah, so uh, it, if, uh, if anyone in the, the New York City area, we are uh, super easy to find at, at Fort Lee Historic Park. Um, just find the George Washington Bridge, look at the east side of the river, or if you're a fan of Law and Order, um, if you see any of the clips of the Hudson River, just look at the bridge. Uh, you can see the park uh, right there on the, the east side. Uh, you drive across the, the, the bridge coming out of the city, we're right there um, on the left-hand side. Um, uh, it's uh, We have about 30 acres uh, right in the some of the, the you know, a, huge industrial town uh, of, of Fort Lee, um, but we are a, an awesome little green space with a, um, a, a um, kind of a dated museum right now, but we're working on getting some updates to um, the, the inside. Uh, I, I think that's kind of a theme going across the entire country right now in preparation for the, the 250th um, in a few years. So we're really ramping up for that. We're really uh, focusing our efforts on um, you know, trying to, to redo our exhibits, um, redo our, our whole audio visual system. Um, but we have a, we have a two-story museum on the inside. Um, we have some artifacts from, from Fort, uh, Independence that are, um, uh, that's just north of, um, 
where Fort Washington would have been. Um, that was eventually raised, uh, and that was the spot that uh, General Knipphausen took before um, they, uh, you know, took part in the assault on Fort Washington. So we have some some artifacts from there. We also have some artifacts from uh, we have some cannon shot from um, locally in Bergen County. Uh, unfortunately, nothing on Fort Lee uh, is um, from the from the time period. We have a lot of recreations. We have um, a whole battery of cannons. We have a mortar battery, uh, a, a authentic replica of a blockhouse from the era. Um, uh, we have soldiers' huts. We have officers' huts. We have, um, um, and we we once now that we actually are open again, we are starting uh, our lecture series uh, soon. Um, we had that going pretty well uh, before COVID last year, where we got some some pretty great speakers to come in um, and uh, give talks on more of uh, kind of like the theme of what. Um, uh, emerging Rev War does kind of the 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 overlooked and uh, and misunderstood um, parts of the the of the history of the area. So we we try and focus on that. Um, but we we you know we uh, we had Washington, we had Green. We love talking about them too. So um, it's definitely something that we try to focus on. And um, on on top of that, like the the whole area, um, there's a, a lot of Revolutionary War history in Bergen County, whether it be. Um, right down the road um, at the at Newbridge Landing um, and uh, we all work hand in hand to to kind of enhance the, the, the experience of the Revolutionary War in Bergen County. Um, but yeah if you if you ever uh, stop by I'm there uh, almost every day feel free to stop in and say hello um, I'd be more than happy to give you a tour. Do, uh, do you all do um I think I saw there's some pictures of them uh, do you do you live in history or have reenactors do? Yeah. Oh yeah so, thank you for reminding me yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, that's like uh, kind of the bigger thing that we do there. Um, so uh, the, the thing that we do the most and uh, kind of thing that, that we're most proud of is our, our school program. We offer a living history program for, um, for uh, grade school kids and um, from anywhere, really, uh, if they're willing to come up there. Um, it's a full uh, 9 a.m. to, to 3 p.m. Um, event. You know, kids get to make musket balls. They get to uh, be a part of the gun crew. They get to um, cook a uh, common pot stew. Uh, they learn how to march. They learn how to, um, uh, what life was like in a colonial camp at that time. Uh, they learn about women and children in the 18th century. Um, it, is, it is truly a, a one of a kind experience. Um, and it's it's something that uh, we, we love doing and we can't wait to get back to doing that in a, um, the upcoming school year, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, but we also do um, some living history programs. We have garrison days for um, several reenacting units. Um, I, myself, I'm out there uh, doing, uh, doing stuff this weekend. We're actually playing a game of uh, 18th century rounders. So if you're in the area and you want to uh, celebrate the, the, the baseball midsummer classic in uh, the Fort Lee way, we'll be out there uh, on the lawn um, doing our best to replicate it in, uh, in colonial fashion. Um, and then our big event is uh, the retreat weekend. So it's always the weekend before Thanksgiving. We get um, pretty much anyone, <laughs> we, I can't even tell you, we get so many units from the Brigade of the American Revolution. They come up there um, and we have a, you know, two days worth of uh, tacticals and skirmishes, um, uh, camp life. Uh, we do a parade to the Monument Park in the center of Fort Lee. Um, and, uh, and plenty of other uh, activities for, uh, um, for living history throughout the year. Um, it's really up to, to what we're looking to focus on or we get an idea and we, we kind of run with it. We're, we're pretty um, fortunate to be able to kind of craft our schedule with the, with the way that we'd like to, but uh, stay tuned, njpalisades.org. Uh, uh, you can find our calendar on our Facebook page. Um, we, we'd love to see you there. All right, and uh, I will drop that into uh, the comments as well, the website so people can, can find it. Uh, but really to, uh, to wrap this up, uh, any final remarks uh, for Lee, for Washington, anything? I know in an hour you can't cover everything, uh, but is there any one thing, one final thing you guys would like to add and we'll close it up? Um, uh, the one thing that we tried to um, to try and push uh, and, and one thing like it, if someone were to walk into the park and they had time for, for one thing, um, that I'd like you to leave with after after visiting Fort Lee and after learning about the history there is that um, uh, pride in your community, pride in the people that, that made, uh, um, that gave us the freedoms that we have today. Uh, and like I was mentioning before, um, just how fragile it all could have been. So never take it for granted. Um, that's something that, that we hope that everyone is able to leave with and just have, leave with an instilled sense of pride in their community. 
And I'll just, I'll follow up on that by saying, um, uh, yeah, I mean, talk about history in your backyard. I wonder how many people realize how many millions of people go over the George Washington Bridge not realizing the history. They're literally wow. driving right over. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, I, having family up in the New York area, I mean, I remember going over that countless times as a kid, never knowing that that's where, where the actual history happened. And, right. uh, you know, right now in the Heights is the big thing on, yeah, on right. you know, that, that neighborhood. Yeah, it's part of this history. All this stuff, all this stuff is right there under the, their feet literally um and so uh it's like trying to to learn about that trying to explore more finding places like the fort lee um uh historic site where they can go and learn more about the, this kind of history is great um and yeah and and this is like i said it, it, it sometimes can be depressing because it's like the lowest point for everything uh but you know i think it was green who said uh you know the, just before the darkest uh hours uh before the before the, the dawn of course that is Trent and Princeton uh, that yeah, happens yeah. right after that, which uh, uh, if you're interested in learning more about Trent and Princeton, uh, this will be the weekend, I think, before your retreat weekend, uh, Emerging Revolutionary War, we're doing a bus tour of Trent and Princeton for folks. Uh, so if anybody's interested in, in exploring uh, uh, the, the victories there after these, these sad defeats at Washington Lee, check out emergingrevolutionarywar.org to uh, get your tickets for that. So. It seems like it'll book in perfectly. You can come on the bus tour and then you can make your way up to Fort Lee and then you can retreat from Fort Lee back so you can do the whole New Jersey um, <laughs> yeah, campaign. Just there. Like Russia for me, please. Yeah, Russia. Um, so um, I would like to uh, thank um, Charlie for joining us tonight. Um, Fort Lee is great. I've been there once um, to visit. Um, he does an excellent job. Um, definitely go back now that they're open. Go see the history sites. Mark, it's always fun. We you made it to 801 before you showed your book, Trent and Print uh, Victor <laughs> Death. That's a record there. Um, last thing I want to say is that it is possible to have a Baltimore Orioles fan and a New York Yankees fan coexist for an hour um, on this uh, Zoom as well. So we'll be back in two weeks uh, for the next Red War of Revelry. Um, we have uh, a special one coming up. Um, we'll announce it here on, on Facebook shortly. So the bus tour in November, uh, information, sign up, and so forth is there. Um, and then the website for Fort Lee is in the uh, comments. So check it out and plan your trip, especially in November when it will be a little cooler, probably. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, uh, just warm. But uh, Charlie, Mark, thanks uh, for joining. Uh, and everyone have a good night and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you for having me.